Okay, hello. We're talking about politics. Uh, at this particular portion in talking about politics, we're talking about critical race theory. And I'm looking at the basic tenets of critical race theory and asking for each one, is there any excellence? Is there anything that's good that we should cling to? And is there anything that's bad that we should reject? And trying to do a, a good biblical analysis of each one. Okay, so today we're looking at the idea of white privilege. So let's talk about this a little bit. First of all, uh, white privilege, uh, what it means is that white people get certain advantages that non-whites do not get. Um, if it exists, then it is like systemic racism and that is pervasive. It happens all the time in all sorts of different places, and it's largely invisible, especially to white people. If it's real, then what's going on is there's ways in which people just give me certain advantages or accommodate me in certain ways without even thinking about it. And that I never notice. I just assume that's the way everybody gets treated. And yet, in fact, people who are not white don't get treated the same way. If privilege exists, then it exists for a lot more than race. There's also rich privilege and, uh, and uh, 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 male privilege and uh, probably uh, tall privilege. I mean, there's all sorts of things that people get just because of some something about them that has nothing to do with that, but they just get certain advantages without people even noticing it. So is white privilege a real thing? And the answer is at least sometimes I'm sure that it is. Once I started hearing about it and thinking about it and looking for it, I found examples. Let me give you two quick examples, one more personal and one that I've just heard. Uh, the one more personal isn't about white or black privilege, it's about uh, male privilege. I have noticed that in fact it is true that I'll be in a meeting sometimes and a woman will bring up a good idea and everybody will just kind of dismiss it and then a man a few minutes later will say almost the same thing and people will pay attention to his view. And it's not it's not always just because he's more well spoken or because he's more uh, it has more credibility in other ways. Sometimes it seems to just be because people respond to women in one way and men in another way. And I've seen that happen. And I've seen where it does seem to have to do only in some cases with the gender of the person speaking. So that's an example. When I speak as a man, there's certain people who will just give me more attention than they would give me if I were a woman. And uh, so that's important for me to recognize that that sometimes happens. Another example is one that's been sort of more, proved more statistically rather than just being an anecdote about what I've seen. They've done a study where they've taken people, they've sent, they've sent identical resumes to companies, except that they've changed the name. And the name of the person on the resume, if it, if it sounds very black, whatever that stereotype would mean, if it sounds more black, they're much less, they're less likely, I don't know if it's much more, they're less likely to get called for an interview than if it sounds white. So nobody's, I think, sitting down and saying, let's deliberately be prejudiced in favor of whites, but it's still just sort of built into people's subconscious preconceptions. They don't even think about it, and that kind of happens. So sometimes, for sure, uh, white privilege happens, and, uh, and male privilege, and all sorts of other privilege. Um, but does that mean that every setback or every success is due to privilege? Sometimes you get the idea that anytime somebody doesn't get an interview, it's because of white privilege, or, or every time they do get something, it's because of white privilege in their favor or whatever else. I think that's pretty clearly not the case. There's a lot of reasons that we succeed or, or fail. There's a lot of reasons that things go well for us or go poorly for us. Some of those things are our own fault or because of our own hard work. Some of those things are just luck or just what God is doing. Some of those things may be circumstances completely beyond our control, and only some of those things will be due to race or due to whatever other uh, thing you need to look uh, need to look at. So no, it doesn't mean it's always at work everywhere that anything ever happens, and that would be a mistake. But it does seem to actually happen some. Uh, does the Bible teach that privilege exists? Well, it doesn't have any place that I can think of where it talks about white privilege. It does talk about um, races, in a sense, it mainly focuses on the difference between Jews and Gentiles and between nations rather than focusing on races. But you can see some of the, some of the same kind of racial tension that we have today. You can see sort of in seed form, you can see principles about that happening between Jews and Gentiles or Jews and Sumerians or so on. Um, but it does teach about privilege in a general sense, I suppose, in different ways. So for example, um, shows other kinds of privilege. For example, Paul claiming Roman citizenship. Here's the example. Here's the story. Uh, the commander ordered Paul to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. So Paul is being ordered to be whipped. When they'd stretched him out with thongs, Paul lets them get all the way where they have him tied down. And then he says to the centurion who's standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who's a Roman and uncondemned? 
And the, when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, what are you about to do? This man is a Roman. <laughs> and the commander came to him and said, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. And the commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, but I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him. And the commander also was afraid when he found out, out that he was a Roman because he had him put in chains. Paul definitely had some privilege here because of his being a Roman. And you can see it's just built into the society and the culture and the, and the laws in that case that Romans were not supposed to be treated this way. Uh, you just, you owed them a certain amount of deference and respect that a non-Roman didn't have any, that wasn't owed to him at all. So this was not a big deal as long as they didn't think he was a Roman citizen. But as soon as he was a Roman citizen, all of a sudden they were, oh no, we shouldn't have done this. Um, there's a, there's a lot of examples of, of what you might call rich privilege, privilege of people who are wealthy. For example, in James, it says, my brethren, don't hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And then when he goes on to give an example of personal favoritism, here's what it is. A man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. You say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? So certainly scripture does bear out the idea that there are times when we will treat one group of people better than another. Proverbs 19.4 says, wealth adds many friends, but a poor man is separated from his friend. It says in practical life, if you just look around, you have a lot more friends if you're wealthy. Now, this isn't exactly the same as what we think of as privilege. Um, let me see if I want to say that something more. Yeah, this isn't exactly the same as what we're thinking of with white privilege. First of all, this isn't invisible in this case. Uh, these things are right out in the open. Everybody knew that Roman citizens got treated better than non-Roman citizens. And we didn't live, the, the Bible didn't have a culture which thought that everybody treat, should be treated equally. That comes from scripture, but it didn't come from the culture around them. There was just this understanding in the world that of course Romans were better than non-Romans or men were better than women or whatever else, whoever was better than whoever. So there was a very easy acceptance of, of unfairness within society. In a way, it only makes sense to talk about privilege in a society in which we expect people to all be treated equally. But that actually comes from biblical ideals. It's because of the fact that Christianity has for thousands of, thousands of years been saying we need to see everybody as created in the image of God and created to have value before God that we started to understand that we want people to be treated equally and fairly. And so now we're paying attention to it. So in that sense, White privilege is a little different than what's in scripture, which doesn't, doesn't uh, really bring that out. But a second thing that I want to emphasize is that in scripture, um, the focus isn't on those who receive the privileges, but on those who have the power to do something about it. It doesn't say, you Romans stop getting special treatment because that's privilege. It says the rulers are the ones who should be paying attention and making sure that we treat people well. So for example, King, in, in Proverbs 31, there's instructions given to a young man, Lemuel, as to what he's supposed to do as a king. And one of the instructions given to him is that as a king, he's told, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. Do you remember when Jesus told the parable of the unjust judge? This widow came to him for help from her opponent, and the judge didn't want to pay any attention to her. But she fi he finally did because she persisted, and Jesus used that an example of, as an example of prayer. But again, built into the parable is just the cultural understanding that sometimes widows won't get attention from the rulers and the judges. Only the rich people or the males or the, the people with power will get it. And so all through the Bible, you do get this picture just embedded in the culture that, of course, in the world, a lot of times people in, with positions that are considered more important will get more than people without White privilege is kind of like that, but it's a little different because of this claim that it's invisible and that it happens in ways that people aren't even aware of. But it certainly is consistent with the idea that there would be privilege. That seems to be something woven throughout scripture. But again, the focus, you don't find in scripture a place where it says, so if you get special benefits because you're Roman or because you're male or because you're a Jewish or not Jewish or whichever, it doesn't seem to say you should feel bad for getting those privileges. So let's move on to talk about why is talking about privilege sometimes problematic? And then after that, we'll talk about what's good about talking about. So first of all, it makes people feel guilty for the wrong thing. I talked to somebody about privilege and said uh, last week, and I said, so I'm about to teach on this. What do you think about it? And he said, well, I think it's a very bad name for something that definitely exists. And what he means is that when we call it, when we call it privilege, we kind of talk, it makes it a little complicated to understand what we're talking about. Because privilege is actually two things together. It's benefits plus exclusivity. Privilege means that there's some benefit I'm getting 
people pay attention to me in meetings or whatever else. And that's one thing. But also, it's not just that I get those benefits. It's that I'm one of the, that, that I'm one of a smaller group of people that gets those benefits. Not everybody gets them. So we do not need to be feel, feel guilty for getting the benefits. We need to feel bad that people, other people don't also get the benefits. So if people pay attention to me in meetings, the problem is not that people are paying attention to me in meetings. It's that they're not paying attention to the women in the meetings. That's the problem. So it's funny to talk, we talk about a white privilege because the people who are really bearing the brunt of it and the people that it concerns are not the white people. It's the black people or the non-whites of any, any, any color. Um, so the pro but, but the problem, of course, isn't the fault of people who aren't privileged. It's, it's the fault of the system as a whole. So it's kind of funny because when you call it white privilege, it feels like you're blaming me for getting the privileges I get. And that isn't Correct. That's not the problem. The problem is that other people don't get those privileges. Um, sometimes this gets taken to kind of silly extremes. I remember reading a, a blog post by a philosopher, a, a woman who was um, very concerned about white privilege, and she had discovered that there was research that showed that one of the advantages white children have is that their homes tend to be stabler and have better financial stability, and as a result, their parents read to them more often when they're young. And because they are read to when they're children, they do better in school and go on to have advantage in life. And so she was thinking, should I stop reading to my children because that gives them privilege and that's unfair. And I wanted to sort of shout at the screen when I was reading it saying, no, don't stop reading to your children. The fact that they get the benefit of you reading to them is not the problem. The problem is that other people aren't able to provide the same benefit. So read your children, but then try to figure out how to help the others. Maybe establish literacy programs, maybe establish uh, things in the libraries which will uh, read to other people's children when they need, or, or, or again, establish literacy programs or encourage other kinds of things or do things financially so that there's enough time and, and stability within families for the parents to read to the children. I mean, do, try to work to solve the problem, but you don't back off of actually using the privilege you have with your own children. That's completely backwards. And that comes because talking about privilege can make it sound like having those benefits is the, is the problem. And that's not at all the problem. The problem is that other people aren't getting it. Also calling those things privileges or privilege obscures the fact that we should get them. Everyone should. So it's not a privilege for you to pay attention to me in a meeting. It's kind of basic respect, but it should be basic respect for everybody, male or female. But don't call it a privilege. It's not something that I'm just fortunate that you're giving that to me. It's something that everybody should get. So I sort of almost want to call it a right rather than a privilege, but I understand why people are saying that. It's privilege in the sense that not everybody gets it, and that we need to realize that not everybody gets it. So there's some really good ideas here, but there can also be some confusion. And so it makes people feel guilty for something that's not their fault. Um, it also belittles sometimes the hard work and struggle of those who are considered privileges, privileged. This is why a lot of people get bugged by it. They're like, um, they're thinking, I really worked hard to get where I am, and I struggled a lot to get where I am, and I ran up against a lot of prejudice and a lot of uh, closed doors, and I got here anyway. And if you turn around and say, well, you just got there because you're privileged, kind of belittles all the hard work and the struggle that they put into things. Um, that kind of creates a competition between who was the most unfairly treated. Look, I was more, you were more privileged than I did. You didn't have to work as hard as I did. That's kind of silly because every one of us has ways in which life is really difficult and we shouldn't be competing to see whose life was the hardest. We should be trying to learn empathy from our own struggles for other people who have other struggles of their own. And I should be listening to you, understanding that there's things you face I never had to face, but there will also be ways in which my life is hard that you didn't know about. So have privileged people had to work hard? Have they struggled? Absolutely, often. Well, not everybody, but first of all, there's lots of different kinds of privilege. Sometimes I may, you may have, I may have white privilege, but I may have been facing, um, you know, a lack of privilege in some other way. Or privilege varies with the setting. For example, as a Christian, in America in general, there's kind of a privilege that goes with being a Christian. People think better of you. But in an academic setting, especially in higher education, sometimes if you're considered, if you're a Christian, people kind of look down on you a little bit. Um, that kind of happens with a lot of different places. There's a certain privilege that, that varies depending on where you are. But even with privilege, that doesn't mean everything in your life goes easily. It, life is sometimes hard. Um, and everyone's life is different. So we don't want to just compare. What we should do instead is use hardship as a basis for empathy. If there's a place in my life where I really struggled, it should help me to recognize that when I see that you face challenges I never even face, it's not a competition between us, but I should think, oh, wow, 
I really empathize because I know what it's like in my own life when some other area of my life was like that. I see that you're facing things I never had to face. That seems really difficult. I want to be on your side. I want to care for you. I want to respect you. I want to see, wow, that's a, that's pretty impressive that you rose above that. And uh, so there's a positive way to look at these things, which doesn't have us fighting over who's the, the most unfairly treated. Um, why is talking about privilege helpful? Because I believe it absolutely can be very helpful. And I'm not saying there's nothing to this. Um, the first thing is it does help us appreciate other people's struggles and hard work. I may think that something was super easy because, and I just, I, I've heard a lot of people say, it's, it's not hard. You've just got to care and work hard. And they don't realize that for them, caring and work hard was, was much, much easier because of certain advantages they had that they're not even aware that they had. It makes them proud rather than grateful. And then it makes them sort of look down on and disrespect other people's tremendous difficulty and, and struggles and hard work in getting to where they are. Um, secondly, though, once I start seeing privilege, I can use it to extend the benefits to others. When a woman in, the, in a meeting I'm in makes a statement and nobody responds, I can jump in and say, you know, so-and-so just had a really good idea, I think. And then I, I don't go and present it myself. I turn to her and say, would you say that again? I thought that was really good. And then I let her say it again. And in that way, I'm getting her the same respect and attention as I would have gotten. And we can do that kind of thing in little ways all the time. And they're just tiny little things, but they make a difference to, 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 um, in respect and in honor to try to extend to others the same kind of benefits we just take for granted and understanding that other people don't always get those things for that they can't take them for granted can be really helpful in helping us how to, to, to know how to live with love and care and concern. Um, Here's some other Bible verses just to think about. Oh, oh, okay. I forgot what I had in here. Um, this isn't directly related, but this last week I was listening to a sermon by uh, somebody else on the word protes, pro, protes, and which is the word gentleness. And um, it's a fascinating word. We're told to be gentle in all sorts of places, uh, but it basically means restraining my power in order to deal with others compassionately. It has two meanings. It's translated sometimes as meekness and sometimes as gentleness. And in both cases, it's about not being violent, not being forceful, and uh, not using my power for, for evil. And when it's meekness, it's talking about my patience and restraining myself when I'm being um, when I'm powerless. I'm being meek in the sense that I'm waiting patiently for God to act instead of trying to revolt or rebel or cause problems. When it's used in terms of gentleness, it's used that way speaking of Jesus, that he's gentle to us. And it's used in the sense of somebody who's strong and has the power, but they restrain themselves from using that power in a negative way. Instead, they use it to help. Um, so that's what we're doing here when we use privilege. We have a certain power we didn't even know we had. And when I notice I have that power, I can use it in gentleness, uh, not to condescend to people, but to help make sure they get the same benefits I would get. And there's a, just another verse, which to me captures the heart here. It says in Romans 12, 10 in, in ESV, it says, outdo one another in showing honor. I want to live my way life in a way that if we're going to compete, I don't want to compete for which of us has had to work the most. I want to. I don't want to compete for us for which of us for which of us has the hardest life. I want to compete in showing you honor. I want to I'll show you more honor than you can show me. I want to just have a little competition between brothers and sisters of Christ <coughs> <coughs> that we strive to show as much honor to each other as possible, and that's what we're doing when we use privilege to extend the benefits to others. All right. Uh, there may be a lot more to say about this. I don't know all there is to know about any of these things. I'm just sort of working them out myself. Maybe you think I've uh, been too easy on some things or too hard on some things. All I'm asking you to do is to sort of follow the same example of searching these things through and thinking, is this biblical? Is it not? Does it show the love of Christ? Does it not? And, and sort of work it through from there. And if you come to a different place than I do, that's okay. Next week, I'm not sure yet, but I think what I'm going to look at is the question of tearing down statues and American exceptionalism and, and what we do about our heroes from the past who also were slave owners and, and so on. And how do we deal with all that? And uh, we'll talk about that probably uh, next week. Thanks.